Thank you very much for staying till the end. Uh, I didn't expect so many faces, but it's always good. Uh, for me, it's very unfamiliar to uh, speak to scientists. I normally speak to architects, and it's a very different audience. Uh, I will try to make it uh, good anyway. Um, <laughs> you will see a lot of images, <laughs> uh, not many formulas or text. Um, first, uh, OMA is a partnership, that's why we call ourselves partners, of nine architects. Uh, we have our headquarters in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam, and our founding partner is Ram Kolhaas. Uh, that name might say something uh, to you. We are a global organization, although we have only 380 people. We have offices in each region uh, where we operate from. And here in China, you might know us from this building, uh, the CCTV building in uh, Beijing, or the other building, the Shenzhen Stock Exchange in Shenzhen. I will not touch upon these buildings, but they will come back later in the presentation because both of them have a very innovative facade. And I will get back to that when I talk about the co-creation uh, with uh, BSF. Uh, for Shanghai, uh, this is a project coming up. I had to kind of simply put the image up today. It's a, a, a first time show. Uh, we are currently constructing a convention center here on the Bund, uh, which uh, will be announced in the press in two weeks from now. We are not only architects uh, that do buildings. And I think that's one of the reasons why Martin and I two years ago connected and uh, started talking about this co-creation. We do buildings, but when you do buildings and design buildings, you have to do a lot of other things. You have to look at social aspects, you have to look at what cities ask for, what the problems of city are, how they change. But you also need to look at kind of what do you use to compose these buildings off, and how could I innovate also these. So from the unbelievable mega scale to the very detailed small scale uh, passes by. And we cannot be experts in any of these fields, but we still need to acknowledge they're all there and find the right people. So co-creation for us is something that is our bread and butter. That's what we need to do to be able to compose our ideas and make these ideas reality. Um, to show you examples of things that you would normally not expect from an architect, this is the energy grid of Europe, which was a pitch to uh, find a new sustainable grid of how energy would, would be distributed from each country to another in Europe uh, about five years ago, and only energy companies competed. OMA was the only non-energy related company that competed, and because of that we could come up with total different solutions and actually won the bid and created the plan. Currently they are creating that windmill ring in the North Sea, which actually was just straight off our drawing board. We also do a lot of writing. Uh, architecture these days is seen as iconic buildings, big buildings, but to be able to make them, you need to understand each little component and go back to its history and also project its future. And this is a book of about 5,000 pages of all these elements that we compose buildings of, looking back all the way in history and portraying what its future is. It's on the market, you can also buy just one volume of one element, but you can also buy this book uh, with all the elements in them. And then we do also just fun stuff. Uh, for example, all the marketing for Prada, but also all their fashion shows, and we even help them design some of their clothing. The suit I'm wearing, for example. So uh, you know, it's a very uh, thing to keep us alive and to uh, keep us kicking. Now to urban and uh, urban living. Um, we sometimes have to work on an unbelievable big scale, the scale of the city. This is a project in China, in Taiyuan, a city just below uh, Beijing, a very important uh, province, especially related to the safety of Beijing. It's a, a province where a big part of the army is located and where a lot of production for China happens. It's also the city that has one of the biggest Buddhas in the world, and that's its main cultural attractions in the mountains. Maybe some of you have been there, probably the Chinese have. 
Uh, it's a very interesting city because it's a city that uh, kind of already existed in Imperial China and actually even was uh, one of the main cities at that time and grew through the Republic and went into uh, the People's Republic uh, era and became a production heart. It was the heart of physical labor. Uh, as we all know, when kind of a country is developing, uh, that part of labor becomes less important and the middle class, uh, the worker in the knowledge economy, becomes more important, which is also now the case in China. And a lot of the remnants of that uh, is destroyed and cities need to change. So it's not only that cities are growing, it's also that cities are changing, which puts a huge pressure on urban development and sustainable urban development. This is a plan that the Chinese government wrote. Second tier city Taiyuan needs to become a new cultural city transformed from its industrial base. And that's then the line that is given to the mayor. And please make it happen in 10 years. Um, that mayor had no idea how to do it. And to be honest, nobody that got involved knew how to do it because the city is based around four factories, a gas factory, a fertilizer plant, an army base factory that produces weapons and another uh, factory that produces uh, chemical, uh, chemicals for food uh, maintenance. We were given the fertilizer plant and we had to transform that in the city. This was the process that was there, scientists anyway, uh, a little bit of uh, uh, chemical uh, stuff in a presentation of an architect. You can explain it to me if you know how it works. The interesting part of it is that kind of that uh, cycle of the process is simply on the site. This is the mayor uh, in our first meeting uh, here on the left hand side explaining to me how the plant works and if I could please transform it in into a cultural city. This is how it really looks. Um, it was only shut down four years ago, so maybe from the Ludwig have a perspective that looks like uh, scrap metal, uh, but it is really uh, the case. It stopped five years ago and it needs to be staying and transforming. It also has kind of a very interesting parts to it. Namely, this is a building that was designed by Soviet architects and there was only a period that the Soviets and the Chinese were friendly of about five years after the Second World War, after that they they were living next to each other, but not with each other. And these buildings therefore have a huge historical meaning. This is the typical condition. And here you see the inside, all the machines are there. You could simply still switch them on if you want to. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, kind of distribution that would not fulfill any regulations anymore this time. And there's a lot of machines that um, are quite toxic, so maybe this shortened my life for two years. Uh, it's what to do. Uh, as you see, I didn't have the answer here yet, and my team also didn't. It's a huge challenge. But we did it before uh, in Germany, uh, in Essen, Solverein, uh, maybe a project that some of you might know, was one of the biggest coal waxes in Germany that we transformed, transformed into a cultural part of the city and it's really thriving uh, these moments. So we started thinking we first have to face this. You cannot do this in one go. So how do you face and if you face, uh, what do you then preserve and what do you do new? Secondly, you need to inject nature back into a site like this uh, to create it in a sustainable way and nature uh, means green and green connection, but also other uh, connections. And then how can you connect it to the city? Because a factory, a chemical factory is of course alien to a city. It, it lives maybe next to it, but you cannot get onto it and you can definitely not live with it. So how do you deal with that aspect? How do you bring the city into that site? So uh, first phase is the core district, still quite big. Uh, still uh, one and a half kilometer each side, each direction. And this is more or less the question, from industrial production to cultural consumption, but also to create that product, because there is nothing at the moment. 
they're factory workers, uh, but how can you fill a museum, how can you fill a, a theater if nothing is produced there? So that was our first step, saying the mayor, don't only do passive consumption, but also bring the production to your city. So we went to talk to CAFA, the creative school in Beijing, and they are now making their second part of schooling in this site, uh, which does a lot of art creation uh, to it. So a museum, as requested, uh, cultural in and creative industries, the driver of economies these days, and of course, commercial program, a housing program to it. As a preservation strategy, we took all the buildings and we looked at what can we use and what do we have to let go. Uh, because, of course, many of them are polluted. Uh, you cannot expose people to it. Uh, but also, some of them have no value because they were built like five years ago uh, and, and therefore can be taken away. Here you see a diagram of all the red buildings that are the main buildings, part of that chemical process that you just saw, the main process that we want to preserve on the site. Then the orange buildings are buildings that we preserve that are supporting to that, and on all the white is new uh, to connect, to make sure infrastructure is linked and people can move from one side uh, to another. And here you see kind of the master plan. I'm not going to explain it to you, but it's just to show you that kind of we are transforming a factory site in the right heart of the city to a new piece of town, and I will show two buildings. So this is the first building, which needs to turn into that museum. This was the heart of the process, where the fertilizer was more or less uh, a kind of made. And what we're doing is connecting these different buildings uh, with a new build in the middle, a ring. Uh, we preserve uh, the whole structure and we open up the structure and other parts uh, that were never meant to be, uh, wrap that total and then uh, preserve uh, uh, the building as a museum that shows modern art, but also the process that was happening in the factory before. Here you see some images. And this is the creator building that CAFA will take. Uh, was a building where the fertilizer was stored before it was shipped. And uh, we kind of make a school on the other side next to it, a bridge that links them where big art pieces could be produced. And then where there was before, the storage kind of currently, uh, the, or in the future, uh, the art pieces will go. That would look like here, the tanks where the fertilizer was in will be replaced by people uh, simply working. Towards the future, we have to give the second phases and the third phase because we need to get about 40,000 inhabitants in this piece of city. And how uh, do we do that? There, the preservation strategy is completely different because uh, we keep only the right essential parts to tell the story and we erase the rest and connect to these pieces new built structure, new city fabric. So this is an image where all the brown is kind of preserved and all the white, which is the main part of the volume, is new. A strip that directs you to the center of the city and a strip that creates an own center for this site. Residential, uh, malls, of course, and offices. So everything that is non-cultural, we more or less push in the next phases of that project. <coughs> Huge amounts of volume, which means volume next to uh, kind of some of that resemblance. Here another part where we use part of the factory simply to use the parking problem. So this will be a main parking house in the future. So you co this is the current situation and this will be the future situation where the highway is lead uh, within and you drive into the building to park. And this is kind of by the cable cart going to the Buddha. So everybody that will go to the Buddha in the future doesn't need to go over a small dirt road but can go with a cable cart from here. So this is a transformation of a part of a city uh, where issues uh, play a role of how do I preserve history, how do I make it unique, but also how can I drive the future right into a place where it normally uh, wasn't allowed to go. 
And this is then the overall master plan. So an urban master plan that, that goes over 42 square kilometers, which is a huge uh, space. Then I would like to go to a project which is a smaller project uh, and has similar issues, but on a total different level. And that also starts connecting back to material again. You saw in the previous project, everything is white. And that's because it is so far down the line. Now, a project uh, that has material and actually is under construction. This is the Xiling Night Market in Taipei, the most vibrant place to go, where every low culture in the place happens. Uh, you can eat stinky tofu, you can eat a live shrimp, and all that kind of stuff, but you can buy cheap jeans, uh, uh, kind of phone covers. This is where people go at night and, and live uh, in, in the hours that they don't need to work. The brief of the project was to replace this and take this away and build a theater. So low culture had to be released, replaced by high culture right in the heart of the city. There was no thought of what that would do to the site and to the people living around it, because the people are actually living there because of the current condition and what would do the new condition to it, and how would it actually alienate. So, super attractive uh, space. People really are living there. It's very uh, sustainable because about 30,000 people each evening go there, which is a lot. And it was to be replaced by this. Uh, this is kind of a, an, an image of a typical theaters these days. Three houses next to each other, an opera house, a dance house, a multi-form theater, and then a wrap around it. Each has their own back of house. It takes a huge amount of space and about 5,000 people can visit this building. So this is 30,000 versus 5,000 on the same site. Uh, people that normally don't pay a ticket <laughs> buy cheap stinky tofu versus people that have to pay 60 euros to be in a seat for an opera. So it's a total different thing for a city. Um, we thought this was very irresponsible, right in the heart of the city with such a history. So we said, kind of taking this away is really bad, and why not try to combine these two and unite low culture and high culture in the heart of the city where it already exists. So this was our proposal, which of course sounds uh, very uh, optimistic. Keep the night market and then build the building above it. Um, we went a step further, we said kind of, you can also combine these three theaters with all their elements and have them benefit from each other so that maybe the pressure of that building could be much less. So for example, they share the back of house, they share all the technical facilities and therefore their footprint can be less and uh, the night market can still exist. So what did we do? We took the three theaters, we combined them uh, together and tried to create the smallest amount of space around it, the smallest cube, uh, that we could then lift above the night market. The nice advantage of that is that the theaters are visible suddenly. In a theater house these days, like today, you don't see the theater anymore. Kind of you're sitting somewhere in the intestines of a building. Here, kind of you're sitting in the things that are actually visible. And you can combine all these back of houses in a small footprint. So this was the image that we submitted for the uh, competition. It was an open competition, 132 participants. We were the only one that kept the night market, by the way. So we were the only one that thinking that was of value. It's not a beautiful building, and that's also how we presented it. We presented it as a machine for theater, something that could drive new possibilities, innovate theater, and at the same time could preserve the low culture. This is the current state. Uh, so the dream uh, became reality because the politicians, of course, immediately saw that keeping that low culture would prevent a lot of protest. Nobody would protest against the building coming if the night market would stay. And actually, a lot of people would like the building to come so that the mix between the levels of society becomes bigger. Uh, so the night market is still at the ground floor. Uh, the building is 54 by 54 meters uh, as a cube, and then the theater is hanging from it, shielding the night market from wind 
uh, rain and sun, which is an additional advantage of the building, people channel through the night market and then find a stair and an escalator that brings you up to the first floor of that cube where is the foyer. And from that foyer, uh, you find three theaters. The first one is the Grand Theater, 3,600 seats. Uh, a plane that is a folded plane. We cut it in the middle and then pushed it together so that it would take, again, less space uh, than a normal theater of that amount of seats would be. And it has a huge proscenium. This is the future. This is the current situation. The multiform theater, a theater with a flat floor that could have many different setups. Uh, Stan Lai is one of the famous artists coming out, out of Taiwan that actually will play this theater uh, a lot. And this is its current state, uh, 600 seats theater. And the nice thing was, we were trying to reduce space. But by reducing space, we found that actually these theaters would connect. And what if we would take the walls between these theaters away and actually create a gigantic space in between? This was, of course, one of the innovations of theater uh, because we could take the backstage shutters away. We could create a stage of 100 meter in length and a 40 meter in width. Suddenly, within a building that was meant to have three separate theaters. Um, I assume many of you go to theater uh, quite often, and the most exciting place these days are somewhere out of the city in an old factory because they don't fit the formal theater anymore. In this space, everything could fit again, something informal, and people, 3,600 from one side, 600 from the others, and if you take the side stages with seats, you could have about 5,000 people looking at the same performance at all. So this is the super theater that we found as an accident through trying to save space. And then the Prosimian Playhouse, which is the dance theater. You go up with escalators, you end up underneath the ball, between the double shell, you move to your seat, and then you are in a round theater. So this is kind of where you come up. This is how it is. It's really a round surface, so you walk on a round surface. Then you go up in between the two layers, as it is today, and then you end up in the theater, uh, in the boxes. Uh, this is it. Another 800 seats uh, in this theater. The ambition to combine low culture and high culture, of course, also means how do you bring them in contact. Uh, through that building, uh, we put a public route. You don't need to buy a ticket, and you can still see a lot. You go through the lobby, you see everybody uh, getting ready for their shows. You go through the technical grid, so first you go in, you don't need a ticket. You go through the technical grid, you see on the one hand the actors preparing, uh, you can see how a theater actually functions. There's a lot of technique needed for it. Then you go all the way up through a cafe uh, to the roof, there you can look at the famous uh, temple and hotel in Taipei. And then you can even move through the ball behind glass, see the performance, hear the performance through speakers uh, without being able to interfere uh, with it. And then you come down again. Innovation for this building was very important. Uh, one of the innovations is this building is on base isolators, something that was not used for buildings like this ever uh, before. And a base isolator, I can explain it very simple. It's like a scale. You put a ball in that scale, you put all pressure on that ball to keep it in its position, and then you build the building on top of that ball. You can imagine what happens when there's an earthquake. The, bil the building starts rolling on the ball over the scale, and when the earthquake stops, it comes back to its original position, and it stands. That was the ambition. Uh, Arab helped us uh, not only uh, think about that ambition, but actually develop it. So this building is on 67 scales and balls, and it just stands there, and when there's an earthquake, it can move freely and it comes back. It's a system now that is also used after that for skyscrapers, because it's much better than rubber, of course, as you can imagine. The other inventions that we did were on the facade. Uh, we 
thought that it was important to keep the structure of the cube very pure and not have another substructure. But we wanted it to be glass so that everybody could look in and see the foyer, see the theater players. So we developed a type of glass, which is corrugated glass. It's two sheets together, uh, and it is curved. And because it is curved, it has the possibility to carry its own weight. So we have sheets of 7 meter 40 glass, uh, curved, carrying itself, just standing on shelves. No substructure needed, and they're currently applying it. You see it, it's kind of three layers of a scaffolding. So it's a more or less a load-bearing glass uh, safe structure. And then the auditoria, we wanted to have seamless aluminum. Uh, that, of course, doesn't exist on these scales, but how can we uh, achieve it? Uh, we did a lot of testing, and in the end, the shipbuilders that lose uh, their competitiveness and actually lose their business these days because of planes, uh, came up with the solution that we're using here. So we're going to make huge sheets of aluminum, just as big as uh, we can support. They will be welded on site, and then kind of the weld line will be taken away, and then we will pearl blast the whole facade. So you will see a facade that almost has no seams over the whole curve of these huge theaters, which is an interesting thing. Uh, that we did the good thing, uh, the building is already, without being finished, part of the art of the city these days. Uh, so kind of the, the idea of about thinking about culture in cities and buildings in cities is very important. Now I go to, I already give an idea about how architecture, uh, the city, but also materials play a role. Now I go to materials in another sense. Um, First, the classical way, before we were working with uh, BSF uh, on materials. Then, uh, this is a project we just finished in Milan for Prada. As I said, we do everything for Prada. This is their foundation. This was their factory where they're producing clothes. It became too expensive to do it inside of the city, so they put it outside of the city, and they transformed these factory halls into their museum, their private museum. They have a huge art collection and we made uh, the uh, building for that. Uh, so we kept the whole outside structure, which normally kept the people away. Now we w had to bring the people in, uh, and we built new buildings next to it, including uh, a tower. And we wanted to make sure that uh, the history of that building would stay. So here you see the concrete of it, but this is the finished situation. We kept the concrete buildings uh, that were the factory buildings. We built new buildings in. They have one facade material. I will talk about that later. And we kept two towers, and they are gold. <coughs> gold, that sounds expensive. Um, it sounds very expensive, actually. Uh, but it, uh, and it's a dream of every architect to say, OK, we make a golden facade. Um, we were given a budget for this project, and especially for the facades, of 120 euros per square meter. That's very low. Kind of 600 square me uh, euros per square meter would be the average facade cost. So we first tried brick, uh, because we thought that's cheap. We are Dutch, so we built everything in brick, so we thought that must be cheap. That was not so cheap in Italy. Actually, it would cost about 400 euros per square meter. Then we tried fair face concrete. It was also not cheap, because it had to be finished well, and that costed about 380 euros per square meter. And then we said, OK, what kind of craftsmanship is available in Italy uh, that we could use to finish the facade? So we just make a backing structure, and we put a finish on it. They said, ah, we can paint well. Uh, so we did a painted facade after that, 138 euros per square meter. Still too expensive. Was not a very good idea. Uh, Prada was still not happy. But then somebody in their uh, uh, organization was making new fabric, and they were actually putting golden uh, rope through that fabric for a motif. And they said, that's cheap here. There's a person that knows everything about gold here in Milan, and it's very cheap. So we went to talk to that person, 
And he came up with a layer of gold, and it's really gold, of 1.5 millimeters that has a coating on the outside so that you can simply wash it down. And the price of that facade was 112 euros per square meter. So we did the golden facade, and it was cheaper, cheaper than brickwork. So by accident, trying, 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 uh, it was possible. And everybody that we tell it says, you're nuts. But it's kind of completely true. So this is the golden facade. The other facade is foamed aluminum. Even cheaper, 68 euros per square meter. It's namely waste of the aluminum process. What we do is we gather all the waste, we put it in a container, we put an explosive in that container, it blasts and it blasts everything to the wall in a compact way, and then you have a material that weighs almost nothing, that you can waste and hose down, and is a facade material. And all the other parts of the building are cladded in that material. So it's waste material, reuse of, of the construction method, and it looks like this actually quite luxurious as well. So that's how we did material development before I met Martin. Uh, now we are sometimes working together on materials, and the interesting part of our first discussion was we know a lot of materials, and we know how to deal with them, and we said we have a lot of demand, but we don't know anything about it. And that chain that is in between disturbs that process. Because if I ask my glass supplier to innovate, he will only innovate 5%, because he, of course, doesn't want to put his other product out of the market. If I ask a facade uh, uh, consultant to innovate with me more than that 5%, they maybe go to 8%, because they also depend on the person that makes that facade in the end. So I can never push them. But if we take that chain away, and me as a dreamer, fine to call an architect a dreamer, because that's true, uh, can say something what I would want to have, and you maybe, as an enabler, uh, could help us with solutions. And that was kind of how we set it up. And we set about. We, as dreamers, came up with nine ideas that we wanted to do. I will not go over all nine of them, and BSF selected three with us. Translucent, translucent building material, I will go into that later. Uh, fire-resistant glass uh, and dynamic glass. And I will go into the dynamic glass first because that's the furthest we are at this moment of time. Um, so this is a typical floor plate, east, west, south, north. South is, of course, problematic, solar and heat gain. But east and west are, for architects, even more problematic because it has heat gain and glare. And glare, these days, is something we want to avoid. Uh, because this is the normal, typical solution of preventing glare. Blinds behind the glass facade, and these blinds never go open, or they break down, or they become ugly, and that gives, of course, a bad uh, view to the building. Even worse, kind of now Facebook, Google, Apple are building their new headquarters, and all of their facades have no windows anymore because of this glare, glare issue. They put fiber optics in the facade, they transport the light they harvest through fiber optics to the ceiling and portray the daylight down, and all the walls are closed. And Zuckerberg says even in a, in a movie that he's very proud of that, because that focuses his people uh, to the work. As an architect, I'm not 100% sure if that's a good solution because nobody can look outside anymore and your connection with the rest of the world. And I like Facebook a lot, but I don't think it represents the world, is gone. So how can we try to solve both of them? Um, this was the dream that we tabled to uh, BSF, namely glass that would respond to sunlight within three minutes, that would harvest that sunlight, uh, that would keep the heat gain out, and uh, that also would be able to do a few other things. That's more or less it. Uh, and a lot of people said, why didn't you ask 10 years ago? Because we have some products that actually could work for you. And that's where we started. So this was the overall dream and the diagram that we tabled. We want to improve the solar heat reduction. We want to have new glare. We want to have less 
heat loss in the winter, less visual impact, harvest energy, uh, new light management. And by the way, this had to be clear glass because architects hate colored glass. You know, that's a really important statement to make here because scientists don't seem to understand that blue glass, green glass, reflective glass, it's all horrible. Yeah? It doesn't look good and it interferes with the intelligence of people. So don't come with a filter that is green, blue or whatever. Yeah? Clear. So that's what we did, and more or less, this was the diagram that we then produced together. We want to more or less target everything, uh, energy, light, the optimum of it, and we want to combine all these functionalities in one sheet of glass. So we set about, first, 10% improvement of the solar heat reduction. That was kind of the 10% that we thought was interesting. Then we found that there is a product that already does 21%, so we wanted to do 31% uh, on top, so 10% more. And this is a sheet of glass that we received from BSF, um, actually the filter in between, of course. They didn't produce the glass themselves. It's pretty clear. This is one of my collaborators holding it up. And this already achieves 42%. So we were even modest with our 31%. This already 42%. If we calculate what that does on energy, and I'm not even talking room saving of MAP equipment, but just energy per year for CCTV, that would reduce the cooling savings with 15%. And I only looked at cooling, and that would be about 216,000 euros per year. For Shenzhen Stock Exchange, 17%, because it's of course another layer, that would be 112,000 euros per year. So if you would just keep innovating this, it would be for every building a huge saving on money, but also a huge saving on space, because you don't need the same equipment anymore that you needed before. Then the second one, less heat loss in the winter. Um, so we're trying to develop now an R value of 0.3, uh, which is uh, kind of never uh, done before. Uh, there is no kind of real situation yet that we can have it, but we can simulate it at this moment of time. Then uh, energy harvesting, that is kind of the easy part, BSF told me, so they are not focusing on this. Uh, then, <laughs> so we need to go to an efficiency of 10%, uh, which is uh, easy apparently, so I will wait for the solution at the end of the whole process. And then this is already uh, possible through nanofilm. You can already harvest the light. I just set it. So this is something that is not new. And then you can distribute the look simply equally over the ceiling, which uh, reduce. And then this is kind of the most important, uh, uh, sorry, the visual. Sorry, this is not what I'm trying to say. This is the light transmission of 19%. So this is the clear glass statement, as I already said before. And then this is the most important one, the response to the glare and kind of a glass turning rotary and opaque slowly and then coming back to its original clear position. And that within three minutes. Uh, what is the interesting part of that is that kind of on the inside, if you have an important conference with uh, Bill Gates that's just building his new headquarters, and if you see if the sun hits the facade on one side, you turn, see that facade turning opaque, but where the sun isn't, it's still clear. And then later on, when the sun is there, it will be opaque there, and it will be clear somewhere else. And that's kind of the idea. Uh, currently, uh, there is a kind of a solution that works within about 20 minutes, and it's not completely turning back to clear yet. Uh, but uh, there are very promising results that this could even work. And then if you combine all these things together, uh, you get a piece of glass that we call dynamic glass. And I am pretty sure that every architect in the world, if that piece of glass comes out, and it is really clear and it performs like that, uh, will use that piece of glass. Uh, because that, of course, uh, solves almost all the problems uh, that we're having. So. Of course, this is a dream, yeah? kind of we are dreaming together, uh, but it seems that four or five of these things we are already able to solve on its own. If we then 
are able to combine them, we might have the product that we're actually dreaming about. The other one is translucent building material. I already said something when I presented Taipei. We use kind of now all kinds of different shapes of translucent building material to carry its own weight. And it would be interesting to kind of simply don't need a substructure anymore. And um, then all this in an image could simply also become transparent and translucent or whatever you want it to be. Uh, you could think that it's already there because windmills are in its kind of polymer structure already completely transparent. They turn yellow over time, that's why they paint them. Also they paint them for because people will not accept them to be uh, uh, transparent. So that's a kind of combination of it. And BSF is currently testing kind of the, uh, the uh, strength of it because we also estimate that all the structures could shrink uh, when they're doing it. Um, and then the third one, this was the easiest one, uh, three hour uh, resistant coating on glass. Uh, and as an architect, that is really a dream to have. Kind of when we told it to you, kind of you said, oh, we should have known that before because we can really easily make that. We have to put everywhere where there needs to be a fire separation now a concrete or a solid wall because we need three hour fire resistance. Every type of glass that is currently on the market only has two hour. So we have compartments of 150 square meters or sometimes 350 square meters depending on the country where there are solid walls around it. And we would try to avoid that. Uh, if that would be glass, kind of the whole plate could become available. And this uh, hopefully soon uh, we can launch together. So for us, kind of it made it much easier because we don't have to figure out all the ideas. And for you, it made it kind of very interesting kind of just to have a dreamer around and trying to kick you into the right direction. And that for us uh, was also the inspiration of the Think Cell Atelier that we're currently running during this, uh, uh, during this uh, uh, conference uh, in the hall. Please uh, take a look. Uh, what we are doing uh, there is uh, uh, what we are doing there is kind of doing the same process. We dream up something, and then together with the scientists of BSF and also some outside people from universities and other companies, we're trying to bring a solution. We started this morning based on the feed that you gave in the app, uh, and you have been you could read this. I also announced it yesterday, and we came up with five. Uh, different things that we are exploring in these thir 36 hours today. Durable floating foundation material, fast self-growing building material, so instead of printing buildings, growing buildings, combination of single uh, material innovation uh, that can interact in a more personalized uh, material. So you have a lot of innovative materials, but what if you layer them and, and connect them? Could they perform better than when they do single? Bacteria harvesting, there are materials actually that kind of push materials away, bacteria away or kill them, but there's nowhere, no material that actually harvests them so that you can measure bacteria, bacteria activity. Uh, that would be an interesting thing. And shock absorbing, regenerating lightweight material, polymers. For example, for a car, if you hit uh, a car, that it would kind of bounce back uh, uh, for itself. So. I will only go into three because I'm through my time already. Uh, floating structures, currently very difficult because all the structural materials have corrosion issues and uh, all the materials that don't have corrosion issues are not flexible enough or are uh, not strong enough to resist the power of the sea. Why do we say that this would be kind of super interesting to have is because of cities Me all the mega cities are on the water, but the water is a seen as a threat. Yeah, you can walk around it, but you cannot really use it. Since the Second World War, everybody is dreaming on how can we use Tokyo Bay, but it is not used until today because there is no floating solution. So what if there would be a floating material that you could kind of put on that water, for example, for the Olympics? Kind of the biggest riot today in Tokyo is that the whole city needs to change for a few stadiums that need to stay for two months and then the whole city has been changed and nobody actually wants to do that. What if you could do that in Tokyo Bay on floating basis and take it away after the Olympics? Would be an interesting thought.
to think about, especially if a material uh, knowledge is combined. So it's not only resilience, but it is also kind of uh, gives new opportunities. What about 3D growing of buildings instead of 3D printing? 3D printing has the, the problem that it kind of makes more or less slices. And you have to combine these slices, and the overall then becomes as good as the amount of slices you have and the fixture you have through the slices. Growing patterns are, of course, much more three-dimensional, helix shape. Uh, why would we not grow buildings? And how could you do that? For me, it was very interesting to already hear some BSF scientists giving solutions to how we might jet, uh, make, make materials through air jet with lasers intersect and in, uh, infrared. So kind of it's maybe an interesting thing to counterproduct 3D printing. And then lastly, this is the layered cake that one of the BSF people drew with different type of materials that are already available, but when you would combine them, uh, it could perform different things. For example, it could generate energy, uh, it could, uh, although it's a structural material, have a soft feel when you touch it, and it could even potentially change its identity when you touch it. Uh, so, for example, in public space, a bench that looks very resilient and hard, uh, kind of when nobody is sitting on it, when you sit on it, it actually becomes soft and changes its color. Uh, could be a very interesting uh, type of material. So this is about co-creation, and I thank you very much for your attention at the end of the day. Let's have a beer. <laughs>